So I'm going to present on behalf of my colleagues um, who are listed here, also um, geoarchaeologists. Um, you've heard a bit about micromorphology already this morning from Melinda. I will explain what it is very briefly for anyone who doesn't know, um, and apologies for anyone who does. So, as Alex mentioned earlier, um, I have a project um, that uses geoarchaeological data to inform and drive heritage management research strategies um, across Europe on medieval castle sites. Uh, the project's called All Along the Watchtowers, Balancing Heritage Protection, Development and Scientific Research on Buried Archaeology of European Castles. All, all along the watchtowers for short. Um, the project came about by going to various micromorphology workshops. Um, these are practical workshops. And realising that quite a few of us had samples from um, a few castle sites. Uh, this isn't very common in the world of geoarchaeology, finding other people who are working on castles. Um, and actually the excavation and scientific research on the buried archaeology at castles can often be overlooked um, in favour of sort of examining standing remains. So we're using uh, or applying soil micromorphology to understand the buried archaeology um, as this technique helps you to understand the activities that take place at high resolution and then you can link this to um, link the castle and the activities to the exploitation of the wider hinterland. So the project um, is reviewing the state of archaeological remains across Europe. We have quite a good coverage of castle sites um, where we have soil micromorphological data from. Um, so Britain, well, Scotland, um, Estonia, France, Italy, Latvia, Poland, <coughs> Spain and the Netherlands. Um, and the sites, because of their sort of wide geographical spread, have a, sort of represent a diverse range of cultural and environmental contexts. So we want to use the um, scientific data um, to inform the heritage management strategies. Um, I will say a bit more about how we can do this in a minute. Um, but what I also want to do is present the micromorphological evidence for activities such as crop processing, animal management, um, evidence of building materials, and different phases about the development and abandonment of the monuments. And then these aspects can be considered in the context of the wider landscape. So, just to show very quickly <laughs> the spread of castles that we have across Europe. So the colours around the boxes um, correspond with um, the colours of the map. <laughs> so um, the castles that I'm working on um, mainly arise from working on the Ecology of Crusading project in the Baltic and also in the project that um, Guillermo has just presented. Um, the castles in France, Quentin spoke about earlier, um, and some of the data from GN will be used in this presentation um, today, now. Um, I've just come back from Scotland, where I've been out in Isla, in the wilds, uh, working on a, um, a castle there. Um, so, very different cultural context to the ones in the Baltic and Melina, more sort of clans and whiskey than, um, <laughs> than wine and <laughs> um, conquest. And we have a case study from the Netherlands as well, and two case studies from Italy. So, soil micromorphology is a geoarchaeological technique and we're using it to also identify potential threats to the buried archaeology. And these threats can come from activities such as 
uh, restoration and conservation work. So where you have sort of remodeling of areas of the standing remains, once you start uncovering the buried archaeology, that affects its preservation, particularly if the material below is waterlogged. Um, excavation itself is also a threat to the buried archaeology. So we want to make the case that when it is uncovered, that um, using a, a sort of high resolution approach to examine it um, is very beneficial, both in terms of presenting um, the history of the castle and linking it to its wider hinterland. Castles can also be used as hotels. <laughs> they make nice hotels, people want to stay in them. <laughs> um, but uh, this is obviously a threat to the archaeological um, evidence. And I've put a couple of things down here. Um, particularly in the UK and the Netherlands, um, there's been programmes of in situ monitoring and preservation. Um, it's not something um, I'm going to sort of propose here. These projects can be very sort of time consuming and cost a lot of resources. Um, instead, I'm going to explain how soil micromorphology can help to inform us about chemical weathering of um, materials and sediments, decay processes, particularly of organic remains, and bioturbation, so the reworking of archaeological stratigraphy. So, soil micromorphology um, is a technique where you take a block of soil <laughs> um, from an archaeological site and you want to keep this intact. Um, it is then impregnated with resin, and I do this on the vacuum, um, and it then forms a solid block, which we cut and grind and mount it onto a slide down to a thickness of 30 microns. And it allows a sort of high resolution, multi scalar analysis of the archaeological stratigraphy. So you're effectively taking part of the site, um, as it was, back to the lab and looking at it down the microscope. And I look at the thin sections at a range of magnifications from times 40 to times 630. So it helps you to understand how your stratigraphy has formed. Um, where your materials came from, your sort of anthropogenic inclusions, but also the sediment input, and how this transformed after it was deposited. And this provides us with a very sort of good understanding of the formation processes of a site, so its development and abandonment, but also the use of space. And just to show what the finished product looks like, um, this is a thin section. Um, so through the archaeological um, stratigraphy, this is through a midden at Carpsey Castle, and this is the polarizing microscope. So, as I said, it helps you to understand materials and preservation of the buried archaeology, um, processes such as bioturbation, um, fluctuations of the water table. Things like decalcification, if you have ashes and mortars in your buried archaeology, the movement of clay through the profile, so the weathering processes, and if your um, site is sort of near a marine source, um, formation of pyrite and things like that. So the castles, actually, all buried archaeology had very good preservation, and this is something we noticed by comparing. Um, our profiles and thin sections. And this um, can be attributed to a variety of reason, reasons. Um, rapid burial um, due to collapse of um, standing remains that have sealed um, the buried archaeology. So obviously, in the context of managing a castle, if you then move that rubble to do something else with the tower or reconstruct it, you're uncovering that material that has been sealed by that collapse. Um, later building activity, so castles are very dynamic, there's lots of modifications, and later building material can also seal the uh, buried archaeology and help with the preservation. Um, some of the castles, particularly Baltic ones, had waterlogging of the buried archaeology, 
Um, suddenly aridity at Molina, as well as the collapse of later building, led to excellent preservation of ash materials and, and things like fish scales as well. Um, some of the castles, particularly the Italian castles and the one that I'm working on in Scotland, the later phases have been um, subjected to quite a lot of bioturbation and weathering processes. The role of different geologies also has an effect on the preservation. I won't go too much into this now. So all the castles were excavated as a result of um, different heritage perspectives. So, um, Elblong, Gien, um, Castle Keverberg, Castle, and Cairn. These were excavated ahead of development, um, so rescue excavation. Um, Karksy Castle in Estonia, and the two exa Italian examples, Castle Seprio and Monte Grotto, and Molina. These have been, um, the work has been done as part of research programs. So I just wanted to um, show some of the nice profiles that we have. This is a profile through the outer bailey of the castle um, at Elblong. And you can see this bit here, which is blown up, these really sort of dark bands. Um, organic bands here. Um, this is where the samples were taken from. But once under the microscope, you can just see how many, well, even just cutting the, the samples, you can see how different all the different layers are. Um, and that sort of detail you're not getting in the field. Um, it just looks quite homogenous. And it was full of sort of um, charred cereal grains, um, animal dung, uh, which turned out to be from large herbivores, possibly horses, completely paras intestinal parasite eggs embedded within it, and evidence for foddering of these animals through um, large sort of sheets of articulated husk vitamins. And again at Carpsey, exceptional preservation through a midden and a pond below. And these two examples really sort of help to highlight um, the sort of development of the castle and the earliest occupation of these castles. Um, this is often sort of lost and not really properly um, investigated. And it turns out you have a lot of timber structures lying beneath um, the, the stone masonry standing remains. And again, we had um, coprolites from um, sheep or goat with fragments of millet embedded within. So you could see that um, the millet was, uh, it doesn't actually appear until a lot later. So it was being brought with these sort of earliest um, occupiers of the castle as fodder. <coughs> and we can also look at middling maintenance practice with um, bits of eggshell, bone. Um, all very nicely preserved. So we can look at animal husbandry and then compare this um, to what is going on in the wider landscape, comparing this to zooarchaeological remains as well, um, looking at the evidence for um, coprolites and linking this with palynology as well for things like um, dung spores from herbivore dung. You can also look at um, resource use using the microscopic evidence, um, looking for evidence for crop processing, also looking at the management of fish resources. <coughs> so this is something that came up in the park scene. Um, the creation of the small pond by the earliest occupiers, um, we found fish scales on that, so they were managing fish on the castle site. So, I'll skip this um, quite briefly, I think I'm running out of time. Um, 
So we really want to look at the effects on these organic domains, and the soil micromorphology is a very powerful tool to do this. <coughs> and these are the ashes that I mentioned at Melina. Um, these were buried by the collapse of the tower. And you can see here, they look like they were thrown out yesterday. They are so well preserved. Um, and I have micromorphology samples um, from this. And one thing that the evidence really shows is that um, the preservation of the evidence is very context specific. So we have such a broad coverage of sites. You can see that the, um, the evidence preserves in different ways depending on where you are. So your copper lights um, preserve very nicely here in the waterlogged um, sites, but here you can see at Molina, it's more just of an amorphous um, smear <laughs> of uh, sort of phosphate, quite isotropic. But because it's calcareous, we have these little things um, surviving. These are people spherulites that form in the guts of animals and they're calcareous. And because this is a calcareous geology, um, these preserve very well because they dissolve below about a pH of 7.7. .7. Uh, this is the castle that I worked on in um, Scotland um, and it's here on this promontory here. It's quite a wild and exposed place and we have um, issues with salinity of the sediments which makes it very actually very difficult to impregnate some of our samples with the resin. Um, and it's provided quite a unique opportunity because I've been able to go there from the very beginning of the excavation. So I've actually sampled some of the modern soils that have formed on top. And um, I'm sampling things like turf walls that are exposed, buried turf walls as well. So I can compare a range of material. And we can examine these turf walls in terms of where the material is coming from, looking at the palynological evidence. So this is actually a very good case study um, to sort of use to look at the sort of abandonment of a monument and its development as well. So the project has all these partners who I would like to thank and there's also a website um, with a bit more information about the project. Thank you.